Okay, good evening, everyone. I'm Robin Perlmutter, peer counselor here at Support Connection. I'd like to welcome you all to our annual nationwide ovarian cancer webinar in honor of Ovarian Cancer Awareness Month. Remember that Dr. Herzog is sharing his expertise. Any information from tonight or questions pertaining to individual concerns should be discussed with your doctor. It is with my great pleasure that we have Dr. Thomas Herzog, Dep Deputy Director of both the Barrett Cancer Center and the University of Cincinnati Cancer Institute. He is also the Vice Chair of Quality and Safety for Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. Dr. Herzog is a National Institute of Health and American Cancer Society funded researcher with over 200 published manuscripts. Thank you, Dr. Herzog, for sharing your time and expertise with us tonight. Robin, thank you so much for having me, and it's great to join everybody in the midst of uh, Ovarian Cancer Month. And uh, certainly, um, uh, I look forward to getting through some of this material. I'm going to try to uh, hit, hit some high points and some some uh, some get into some deeper dives on some data. So if I'm losing you, bear in there because I'm going to uh, quickly get out of that. But I don't. A lot of people are extremely informed about this disease, and I don't want to just do the uh, totally superficial materials as well. So we'll do a little bit of both here. So hopefully everybody has something. Uh, hopefully a little bit of something for everyone, so to speak. Let's start a little bit and talk about the natural history of ovarian cancer. And um, unfortunately, uh, as many people on this call know, that the majority of patients are diagnosed, uh, a little over three quarters are diagnosed at stage three or stage four, meaning the disease is in the upper abdomen at the time of diagnosis. And well, with that, we, we see, um, you know, an average, we, we, t we speak in terms of averages, but of course that doesn't predict how any one person is going to do. And for some people, they go through that initial surgery um, and, and chemotherapy and the disease never comes back, which is wonderful. Uh, but for many others, it, the disease does come back and it can come back um, it either never responds very well to upfront surgery and chemo or indeed it comes back many, many years later or something in between. And so that's certainly, I, I think, uh, a different experience for different patients that they go through in terms of the natural history and the timelines that we see. But nonetheless, up to 70% uh, of these patients will relapse and have advanced disease. And then, of course, they're divided into platinum-sensitive and platinum-resistant, depending upon how long it's been since they were treated with platinum and responded. And... Um, we, we then get into looking at uh, a, no, a number of other treatments that can go down the cycle. So I, I think one of the things to really think about tonight is really where is our progress coming from. And I think that the next uh, uh, button on, uh, that's depicted in this slide really, I think, captures it well for me, and that is uh, clinical trials. And so clinical trials have certainly played a major role in our progress. And if we look over time here, uh, not necessarily getting caught up in what the modality is, but we have seen improvements uh, in survival, so much so that we've now been able to push the five-year um, milestone. We've been able to push the averages of those curves out beyond that for many, many women, and that's wonderful news. Uh, what we want to do is cure more women with ovarian cancer uh, is really the, the ultimate goal. Um, but nonetheless, we feel that the, some of the work we've done with looking at clinical trial endpoints has made a significant improvement in terms of the investment and the role of drug development in this space. So we went um, a long time. Um, really almost 16 years without any new approvals, and then we only had um, one conditional approval um, in 16 years. And many people thought that was due to the fact that there was a misunderstanding as to what the bar was for getting approval. And so we flushed this out a lot with the FDA and with some of the regulatory authorities, and uh, I think that we've been able to uh, make some progress in this area. And in this progress, I think, has been very, very helpful in terms of the number of approvals we've had, uh, you know, with, with now, uh, what, five approvals here in the last um, three or four years. So it's, it's been much more productive. Um, I think many people understand how drugs are developed. And uh, before we dive into some of the things, I think it is important to understand this process 
in the sense that uh, phase one trials, of course, are really the, with the goal of figuring out what the right dose is. Phase two is really figuring out if there's any activity in a specific disease. And then phase three, of course, is to see if it indeed is better than what the current standard of care may be. And then, of course, we can do additional work after approval uh, to sort of hone in the best place to use the drug or the best dose and so forth. So those are the things that I, I think certainly make a difference. So I think one of the things that, that uh, is of interest to the group tonight is, is how do we move to precision medicine where we give the right drug at the right time uh, to the right patient. And the real goal uh, that's depicted on the slide is where we are able to interrogate the tumor such that the patient who's orange or blue gets the orange or blue pill and thereby has a better outcome. And so it, it sounds great. It, it certainly has garnered for front page news, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, covers of Time Magazine and others. But what is the reality and where do we stand right now? Well, we are making forays into uh, this area, and I think that uh, these these initial steps have been very successful, uh, but obviously we need to continue to do better. Certainly the first area that's been of great interest has been the whole concept of BRCA deficiency, where we have been able to find that um, those patients who have a mutation, either germline or somatic, um, have a, a uh, different outcome. And in terms of the frequency in the population, we feel that yeah, certainly if we include those with known HRD genes and so forth, we're looking at well over 33 to 40%. If we take those folks out, we're still looking at probably 25 to 30% um, that, that uh, fall into this category. So that, that number continues to be important. From a therapeutic standpoint, we certainly and we'll get into that in a little bit, but from a prognostic standpoint, you can see um, that the the patients who carry these mutations do better. Uh, why is that? We believe that's due to the fact that DNA damaging drugs are uh, very effective in being able to cause cell death in the cancers. And so they tend to live longer, uh, respond to more treatments, and so forth. So that, that certainly makes a big difference as we move forward. So as we look at this, and as we look at this idea of moving to precision medicine, um, and, and, you know, we, one of the things I think that you have to ask yourself is why have we, how have we gotten here and what else do we need to do? Because clearly we're not there yet. We, we don't have the orange pill in all cases that's going to be able to cure the orange tumor. Or, and I think that that's important to understand. But we are making a lot of advances, and it's, been, it's really been built on a multitude of platforms. Um, some of these are really due to the ability to do DNA sequencing uh, at a cost that is a couple of log scales less than what it was even five years ago. Um, we're getting down now where we're very close to being able to do complete genomic sequencing for less than $1,000 right around the corner. So this is something that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars um, not long ago. And so this is something that is very exciting. We also have uh, out of the sequencing comes a real burden of being able to interrogate big data. And so one of the big problems has been what do you do with all this data? And how do you analyze it? And how do you tell what, what is really a true signal versus the background noise? And that's really been a big problem. Um, so it's our ability, our ability to uh, manage big data that I think has really played a major role in, in being able to do this. So as we look at this, lots of different platforms that have been important. Um, and our understanding of molecular biology has improved. We have a better understanding of what these pathways are and do and what's relevant and what's not and where there are redundancies and where there are not. And so there's a lot of things that have been very interesting, the development of uh, the bioinformatics, as I said, but also the development of biomarkers and companion diagnostics has played a big role. Better understanding of, of how doses and exposures change gene expression has played a big role as well. So there have been a number of things, again, that have really looked at how do we interrogate these tumors and how do we go after them. 
Now, one of the things that always comes up, and, and certainly um, we'll, we'll touch upon some classes of drugs, and we'll probably touch upon some individual uh, agents. Um, but you know, with an audience like this, there's, there's a great interest in what's right around the corner, Doc. What is the next big thing? And I have to tell you, part of it is being uh, grizzled and old. I, I have seen a lot of things were the next that were the next big thing. And so my answer to that is always we just have to follow the process. And I understand the perspective if you're sitting uh, where I'm sitting versus where you're sitting, that can be very different in terms of what you say, what, what your demands are for trying to accelerate the process. And, and I completely understand that and I'm very sympathetic to trying to do that and have spent some of my career trying to do that because I do think the process is too slow. This slide depicts what we consider the hallmarks of cancer. Um, and, and so out of this is really where most of the new compounds are coming. So certainly EGFR inhibitors you've heard a lot about. We're now spending a lot of time developing cyclin-dependent kinases that can, be, that can be inhibited with various drugs. And these are responsible for evading growth and tumor suppression. Um, so these look very promising. We'll, get, we'll talk a little bit about some of the immune oncology agents that are out there. Um, th there's a lot of other different things, as you can see here, uh, a lot of other different pathways that, that are certainly of interest. There at uh, 7 o'clock, you see the inhibition of VEGF uh, with things such as bevacizumab or sidirinib and those types of things. PARP inhibition we'll talk a little bit about. Um, and, and you can see all these different things that are really being looked at uh, in terms of how do we get to this individualized medicine approach. So what are some of the pitfalls? And, and so everyone gets excited about this, um, but what are some of the barriers and what are some of the things we face? And I brought one of them up, and that is that when we interrogate these genes, we see so many changes in, in gene expression, so many pathways that are upregulated. What is the cause and what is the secondary effect? And that is a really important principle as we go about trying to figure out what drug or what pathways need to be interrogated or changed to affect a outcome that's going to improve um, the condition of a patient with cancer. And so it's, it's not as straightforward as you would think. It's extremely complex, um, and uh, it's an area that I think we're, we're really starting to gain significant insights that will pay off uh, significantly in the very near future here. Um, Immuno-oncology, uh, one of the problems there is sampling. So we are so used to sampling what? The tumor. So we sample what goes on in the tumor. So we look for viable tumor to sample, and then we sequence that or we interrogate that. But that doesn't have anything to do with what's going on around the tumor. So a lot of the immune effects are actually what surrounds the tissue. So it becomes extremely important for us to get an idea of what's going on in the surrounding tissues or often referred to as the stroma. And so that becomes very important, but it's a new principle, biopsying normal surrounding tissue around the tumor. And these things are starting to become more important. Lots of ideas, lots of things out there, but how we validate them is, is really, uh, I think, one of the things that's really important. We've certainly, as they always say, cured cancer multiple times in mice, but we need to be able to do that in humans where there's an intact immune system. And so this validation system is something that's really important. Another problem is tumor heterogeneity. So what is that? Well, it comes in two forms, right? One is spatial, meaning it's just where the tumor is. So if I take a biopsy from the ovary in a patient with ovarian cancer, um, I may see genetic changes that are actually different than I would if I took it from the omentum or the fatty apron that hangs down from the colon. So you may see a very different type of um, uh, gene expression pattern. The other thing is what about time? So what if I took the biopsy at your original tumor, but now you had a recurrence? What if I took a biopsy from your recurrence? Would they be exactly the same? Well, many features would be the same, um, but many are not. And so there's quite a bit there that, that one needs to consider in, in terms of really trying to put those together because I think that um, it can be challenging um, to uh, 
necessarily assume that things are going to stay the same when we have good evidence that things do change significantly. So where possible, if we are trying to do something in a genetic sense, it's better to get the most recent tissue that we can possibly get if that's possible, and that's not always possible. So sometimes we rely on that original tumor. I wanted to give you a little example of how we are personalizing some of this. So we have a better understanding now that these tumors are very different based on cell type. So we know that serous and endometrioid tumors uh, tend to do a little bit better than those that are mucinous or clear cell, for example. And we know there's very different genetic mutations that are present. And so this was an example of a gynecologic oncology group trial where they said, well, mucinous tumors in the ovary treated like traditional ovarian cancer with agents like carboplatinum and paclitaxel don't do as well. So maybe we should use a regimen that looks more like a colon cancer regimen. And indeed, that's what was designed here. Um, and so there's a real interest in doing this, not only with mucinous tumors, but for example, low-grade serous tumors, where we think that the PI3 kinase, mTOR pathway, as well as BRAF mutations are extremely important. And so um, the FDA workshop that we did uh, on behalf of the SGO listed uh, all these trials that you can see on the left-hand column that were all really aimed at some of the, the unique cell type that we see under the microscope. So you see mucinous, you see low-grade serous, you see clear cell. And these are the ones that we struggle with because traditional chemotherapeutics are not nearly as effective. So we're looking at other agents, often taken from other tumors, such as renal cell tumor in the case of clear cell carcinomas, that have shown real promise and, and have been incorporated into clinical trials uh, in, in terms of uh, really where we're going from here. So um, certainly uh, very interesting um, as we move forward with these personalized medicines, but really, what, what are we trying to accomplish? Obviously, we're trying to have better outcomes. We're trying to improve efficacy. Um, the toxicities are different. I think the first glance of this was that we would potentially have less toxicity. And in cases of these targeted agents, um, there's a lot of unique toxicities that are different in chemotherapy, but they are significant. And so for us to just say, well, they're targeted and therefore they won't uh, affect the uh, rest of the cells in the body is not accurate, unfortunately. Now, hopefully we will get to targeted agents that are ever more targeted and do not affect normal cells. But for right now, we still see um, uh, some changes. So while we get less myelosuppression, less neuropathy, hair loss, we get things like hemorrhage or DVT or eye changes or bowel perforations or the list goes on and on, uh, MDS and some other things that, that are extremely uh, disturbing. But nonetheless, it's, it's extremely uh, appealing to try to uh, hone in on what the underpinnings of a tumor are and try to attack that mechanism. And that's really, I think, the most exciting part of what, what's going on in ovarian cancer right now. There's a tremendous amount of interest in this area. The challenges, I think, I've, I've uh, mentioned uh, already. So how does this play then? What, how, do, how do we look at this? Well, these are uh, a compilation of uh, GOG trials. This is from the GOG 170 series, and these are a mixture of platinum-sensitive and platinum-resistant patients. So you can see the different uh, types of uh, drugs that are out there. Um, and and, and I, I show this to you just to give you an idea of, uh, what we look like or what we look at. And what we're really looking for are two co uh, primary endpoints. One is the response rate, and the other one is the percent that are progression free at six months. And you can see the one that really seemed to hit it out of the ballpark there was bevacizumab. So I think most of you are familiar with this drug um, and, and have seen it uh, used. And so this led to uh, a pretty big investment in terms of adding bevacizumab into a number of the trials here in the United States as well as worldwide, as well as the development of other drugs that inhibit new blood vessel growth. So these drugs are anti-angiogenics. They keep new blood vessels from forming. And as you can see here, um, I've grouped these into um, by... Um, by uh, line of therapy, so GOG-218 and ICON-7, which is a European trial, 
were both uh, frontline trials. Um, and Aurelia and Oceans, and, and, and uh, now we have GOG-213, our recurrent trials with Aurelia being platinum-resistant, Oceans being platinum-sensitive, and GOG-213 being platinum-sensitive. And, um, and the list goes on and on with different agencies. So you have Natindamab, Pazopinib, Sidiranib, Trabaninib, all of which have been developed in this area as well. So you can see they have different targets. Nonetheless, one of the themes that we've seen with these agents has been an improvement in progression-free survival that's been statistically significant. And that's true whether we've been in the frontline setting or the recurrent setting. But we haven't necessarily seen that translation into overall survival with the exception of uh, the GOG-213 trial, um, which was the borderline, um, and, and, the, uh, and the Aurelia trial uh, was an improvement as well. But, but generally speaking, um, it's been difficult. Now, part of that's due to crossover, and it makes it harder then to um, really uh, to uh, show that difference because we treat with other drugs that are active, so it obscures the benefit that we might have seen when we divide into two groups. If the second group that didn't get the experimental drug then gets another drug that's very good, uh, subsequently, it can catch up, if you will, in terms of survival or at least uh, blur that uh, difference to the point that we can't see it statistically. And so those are some of the concerns that we see. Nonetheless, uh, in my mind, we just need agents that are even more active that cause uh, bigger changes in outcome so that we are able to preserve the overall survival effect. Uh, we, we do recognize, though, it is very challenging. Um, but, but, but extremely active agents uh, have a good chance of being able to do that. Now, what about uh, all this immune oncology talk, and what, what is this all about? Well, uh, as you know, um, uh, earlier this summer, there was uh, approval for uh, pembro, uh, pembrolizumab for all microsatellite instability high tumors. What is that? So those are tumors that have mismatched repair deficiencies, and we're able to test that genetically. And it does include a small percentage of ovarian cancers and a very high percentage of endometrial cancers uh, as well as cervical cancers. So uh, this is an area that is uh, gaining interest. It's an area that we're also very interested in um, with uh, combinations. So PARP inhibitors along with uh, these immune oncology drugs uh, appear to be very promising, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But Basically, what we're doing with these checkpoint inhibitors is we are tricking the immune system into seeing the cancer as a foreign object. And you say, well, why would you have to do that? Isn't cancer foreign? It is. But the cancer has already tricked the immune system into thinking that it's not. And, and so that's really what's going on here is that the cancer played a trick on your immune system. Well, now we're playing a trick on the cancer and making the cancer identifiable to the immune system. And so there's a lot of, uh, you know, we could spend an hour and a half, two hours going over some of the mechanisms that are involved with this. Um, and it's an extremely interesting work. Uh, but it gives you some idea uh, of what's out there. And I'll, I'll give you a little overview uh, of where we stand with these agents. So the, the one, one key area is... Um, blocking either PD-1 or PDL one the ligand, um, and, that, and that's one way of doing this. And that's, uh, again, the, the, the cancers use the, that pathway to try to disguise themselves as normal. We unmask that disguise, and then the immune system can see them. We rev up the immune system, and there's a number of ways we can do that. And then um, we bring in the cytotoxic T cells and the helper T cells and so forth, and they're able to envelop the cancer and kill the cancer. And I have some of the agents that, that are down there, whether you, you're going after the CTLA4 receptor or the PDL1, uh, PD1 pathway. Uh, you can see some of the different agents that you may have heard of that are in the, the small box at the bottom. So lots of development in this area. Most of the major pharmaceutical companies have at least one uh, immuno-oncology agent, or IO as we call them. Um, so it's getting quite interesting uh, as we move forward. Certainly, um, you know, this is just to give you an overview, and I'm not pitching for any of these, um, but just to give you a little bit of a, a taste of, of what's out there right now, 
um, and where some of the approvals are. And, and believe me, these approvals are changing so fast, you almost have to update this every other month uh, because there's so much going on in this area. But I wanted to give you a little bit of a flavor of what these agents are doing or what some of the co more common agents that have been reported are doing in ovarian cancer. And so we haven't seen wildly, um, wildly effective numbers in terms of response rate. However, we have seen some responses that have been uh, interesting um, where we've had heavily treated patients who respond to these agents um, in terms of not progressing. And so there's, different, there's actually a different system used for measuring response, immune resist criteria that's used because many of these agents are what, we know, what, what are known to be cytostatic, meaning the cells don't grow, but they don't necessarily lice. Like chemotherapy often kills cells. Eventually, the immune agents do that, but it takes a, a lot longer. And so one of the things you want to see is that they're at least slowing tumor growth down. And, um, of course, they have a unique set of toxicities as well and uh, can be related to inflammation of a number of vital organs, including the lung, the liver, kidneys, the bowel, and so forth. So certainly something that uh, we need to learn in terms of how to manage these drugs in patients uh, effectively. This, this particular slide is a busy slide again, but it has a tremendous amount of information showing you some of the trials that are out there in different lines of therapy. So these are uh, really taking patients that uh, are after frontline therapy. There's a number of trials looking at some of the agents there. Um, if you're platinum-sensitive recurrent, if you're recurrent with platinum-resistant disease, a number of trials that are out there as well, some in combination, some a single agent. But it just gives you an idea uh, of the tremendous amount of interest that is going on right now um, in the immuno-oncology drugs in ovarian cancer. So very exciting times. As I said, this came out um, uh, this past year. Uh, with the approval of Pembro uh, in this patient group. Uh, again, some of the patients are, are, are exactly that, uh, patients that really um, uh, will have MSI high and could potentially be treated. So let me, let me get to the PARP inhibitors because I think this is a very interesting story, and I wanted to spend a little bit of time on this as well. So one of the real interests has been how do we, uh, we, we know that these patients who have these BRCA mutations um, have trouble repairing double-strand DNA breaks. One of the other phenomena that people have noted is that if you use a PARP inhibitor, of which there's almost 17 ISO forms, but PARP1, 2, and 3 being the most active and PARP1 and 2 specifically being the most active, we see that you actually can't repair your single-strand DNA breaks. Well, remember, you're, you're creating single-strand DNA breaks every time you try to replicate because you have to nick the DNA so that it can unwind and then you get the replication fork to come along. And so this is a process that's going on 24-7 every day. And in fact, there's probably de novo cancers that are arising every day in every patient. And that's why the immune story is so interesting because in many cases, your DNA is able to be repaired properly. Um, or if it's not, your immune system often recognizes this cancer before it can disguise itself and, and therefore uh, eliminate it. And so that's why people are so interested in this interaction between the immune system and PARP inhibition. And so this idea of, of using a PARP inhibitor in someone who already has a problem repairing DNA from their double strands is very interesting because if you have an accumulation of single-strand DNA breaks, you get an accumulation of double-strand breaks. And if they're not able to repair those, that results in cell death. And that would be cell death in the tumor. And so that gets into this concept of synthetic lethality where you have two different uh, pathways um, that you're targeting uh, and that you're, you're using to help one another in, in terms of outcome. And so this is very important in, in terms of what one sees. And indeed, there's been a lot of interest in this in the last decade. And there's been um, 
some fits and starts and, and progress and then stops and so forth that have occurred in this field. It's been very interesting in the sense that there were um, some very interesting programs and that were abandoned and then reclaimed in some cases and others that were abandoned forever, even though there appeared to be a tremendous amount of activity. Um, so commercialization and, and pressure from uh, advocacy groups and, th and all kinds of uh, different factors, I think, uh, went into this in terms of finally getting to where we are today, where we have uh, multiple PARPs, um, where we have uh, uh, choices. And so instead of really flashing through, which could probably be uh, over 150, 200 slides I have now on PARP inhibition, I try to just do a summary slide that's, that's fairly up to date. So if we look at this right now, you have the big three with Olaparib, Rucaparib, and Neraparib. Um, filiparib is being tested in frontline uh, in the GOG setting, and uh, taliparib is uh, really being looked at mostly in breast cancer. So if we look at the big three in ovary, it's olaparib, rucaparib, and neraparib. Now out of those, they all are approved in the U.S. Um, I, I can safely say that likely they will all have very similar labels um, in the near future. So Laparib is approved for greater than third line uh, treatment. And just recently off of the uh, study 19, um, and so two data was approved for platinum sensitive maintenance. So uh, that, that's where that fits right now. Laparib uh, has spent time trying to convert from the capsules to the tablets. As many of you may know that there was a, a huge pill burden with the capsules of 16 a day, so uh, it was very welcome to get to far less tablets that needed to be taken um, with better bioavailability and so forth. There's also a program to look at this with a VEGF inhibitor, Sidirinib, um, and all these programs are looking at um, uh, combined combinations of PARP and other things. It, I didn't spend a lot of time talking about that in the slides, but I, I, I do want to mention that that's one of the things that's probably at the forefront right now. So the Paola trial, for example, is, is looking at Olaparib with Bevacizumab. Uh, what about Recaparib? Well, Recaparib is approved for greater than second line treatment. They just presented their Aerial 3 data at ESMO uh, this past week. Uh, for any of you that happened to uh, be monitoring what was going on in Madrid, um, so uh, that data looked very favorable. They had a press release that came out probably, I don't know, four to six weeks before. Uh, there was some new data that was presented, but it looks pretty good. I, I think that it doesn't look all that different um, than what we've seen with the NOVA trial and with the SOLO2 data, in my opinion, and they'll likely get a label in that platinum sensitive maintenance setting as well. And, and so um, they have a slightly different test that they do, looking at loss of heterozygosity um, but they will likely get an approval in, in, uh, across the board, whether you have a BRCA mutation, whether you have homologous recombination deficiency, or whether you uh, don't have any of those. And, um, uh, and, and so what we see with these agents so far, and uh, has been very true with Neraparib that I'll talk about in a second, has been that if you have the BRCA mutation, your differences are, are very vast between the placebo and the PARP inhibitor. So very big differences, you know, 20 some months versus five months essentially in terms of progression pre survival. Um, very impressive in the maintenance setting. As you move to the genes that are like BRCA, but not completely, but they have problems repairing their DNA. Uh, along the homologous recombination pathway. Those are known as HRD genes. And for those patients, they behave very much like BRCA, but not quite as good. And then for those that don't have those genes, nor do they have a BRCA mutation, we still see a benefit for PARP inhibition, probably because there's other DNA pathways that we have not been able to identify yet that are... Um, in play with these PARP inhibitors and it makes a difference. So we're still seeing some good effects and, and those, are, those are good things. Um, uh, but nonetheless, I, I think that um, as a whole, 
most thought leaders will tell you they don't see a huge difference, at least clinically, between these big three that I mentioned, the Elaparib, Rucaparib, and Niraparib. Now, with Niraparib, um, they have an approval not for treatment yet, but they have another trial, a quadrant that's looking at that, and they do have an approval for all comers, platinum-sensitive maintenance, um, very much like we've seen recently with Elaparib and what we'll likely see off the Aerial 3 data from Rucaparib. Uh, they were originally using a uh, genomic scarring test by Myriad, um, and they found that, you know, even their all-comer population seemed to have a benefit, although the magnitude of effect was smaller, um, and yet the FDA approved all-comers on that. So um, we, we might get into some questions on that, and I, I welcome those, but uh, um, it, it's been very interesting to watch this. There's been a lot of guessing as to what the labels would look like, uh, as the FDA interpreted the data, and I think uh, it's been a very interesting time for both physicians in this space as well as patients, um, because there's been a lot of changes just in the last year, um, and that's good. So what are other trials that are driven by integral biomarkers? Well, I just wanted to give you some idea, and there's these things called umbrella trials and basket trials and so forth. And really what we're, what we're looking at is different ways of doing clinical trials, which is one of the themes I really wanted to emphasize tonight. So we need to change the endpoints. We need to look carefully at what those are so that we can speed the efficiency and decrease the cost of these trials so we can get more done with less and get more patients involved in trials. And we also need to not worry so much that the cancer necessarily started in the ovary. If it's a clear cell of the ovary, maybe it should be in a trial with patients who have clear cell of the kidney, for example, and I talked about that earlier, or, or mucinous tumors. They should be in with patients that have GI cancers that, that uh, are of similar stage or what have you, or at least similar genetic changes. And so I think that these are the things that are really exciting. Uh, I think many of you have heard of some of these trials that are, that are here, the iSPY trial uh, 1 and 2. Uh, interesting trial in breast cancer. We now have the NCI MATCH trial, of which ovarian cancer is part of. And I wanted to just show you a little bit of data from the IMPACT 1 and 2 trial because I think it's very interesting, again, looking at being agnostic, meaning not caring as to whether the tumor started, but rather what are the genetic underpinnings of the tumor. So the genetic underpinnings trump the location of where the tumor began. And so this is just uh, to give you some idea, and this was done at MD Anderson, but it gives you some idea of the number of patients you need to enroll to actually find mutations that are targetable, that you have a drug sitting there ready to go that's FDA approved or at least is in a clinical trial that you can use uh, for, for this particular patient. So it's a, there's a little bit of a uh, spin down on that, and we hope that becomes less and less as we develop more agents that are successful. But I just wanted to show you this data because I think it's really impactful. So these are patients that receive a matched therapy based on they were able to find a, a, a pathway or a, a gene that was overexpressed, for example, in, in the cancer, and they were able to target that versus if they just got regular run-of-the-mill chemotherapy. They didn't find anything or they just went on to get uh, regular chemotherapy. You can see the this vast difference in survival there. Those are the two survival curves. Um, with the match obviously being on top, doing much better. So those are the types of things that I think are, are really exciting. So that really begs the question then, should, should I have my tumor tested? And I'm not here to do any commercials uh, tonight for that. Um, Lord knows there's enough vendors out there who, who do this. And I, I do think that um, it's the future, and some will argue the future is now, and some will argue the future is last week. Uh, others will argue the future is the future and that we're not quite there. We haven't validated uh, any of these in terms of showing improved survival in a prospective manner, although that's very difficult. We do have retrospective data, and I've been part of some of those studies, and I certainly have an interest in this. Um, but I will have to admit that we... Uh, we have not validated this in a way that it needs to be validated. And as we continue to learn more and more about these pathways and these genes, as well as develop drugs against these pathways and genes, we will get to the point, no doubt, where this will be a routine part of care. 
And as I said, that could be as soon as uh, this end of this year, or it could be in two to three years. I don't know. Uh, or it could be longer. But I will tell you, I, I think it's certainly part of it. Um, how many of these companies will still be around? Uh, I don't know. Um, and, and, but it gives you some idea of, of um, uh, the competition in this space um, for, for doing uh, tumor testing. We could talk a little bit about that on what they're seeing. So there was not an overexpression and there was no vulnerability that they saw uh, that would necessarily work. Now, again, um, I have seen these types of reports um, and I have seen patients who have responded to therapies that weren't supposed to work and I've seen patients who didn't respond to therapies that are supposed to work. So to me, we are at the very beginnings of this. Um, we are very close to having uh, something that I think is going to be very exciting, um, but we just need to keep our head down and continue to uh, do a little bit better in terms of developing uh, more strategies that really get us there. One of the last things that uh, I wanted to talk about is that I, I don't think that we as clinicians have done a tremendous job of listening to patients. And so there have been some good studies that have come out recently um, and I, I tout this one because I know it, not because I'm the senior author on it. Um, but this was an interesting uh, study, and it was really fun to do, um, but it was an eye-opener. And so our goal was to try to figure out what do patients want out, out of a clinical trial endpoint. Um, we always design these trials, and we say, well, we want to set a difference of X, and, and we want the hazard ratio, which is basically how do the curves look differently across the continuum to be Y, and we want the medians, meaning at at, uh, at uh, 50 percent mark there, how, how different are those, you know, half the patients are going to be at what versus what in terms of the survival. We're on that survival curve, and so we set these studies up to meet certain endpoints and thereby able to call it a positive study or a negative trial if it doesn't meet those expectations. Um, and, and much of this dialogue goes on with the regulatory agencies. For example, if it's a trial that is uh, with the intent of trying to get an approval, for example. So our goals here were to really look at the patient preferences in terms of efficacy, toxicity, quality of life, and sort of putting those and trading those off as they often are. Uh, would you be willing to tolerate more toxicity if it resulted in more cure? Okay, most people would. But would you be willing to tolerate more toxicity, it's a lot more toxicity, if it only gave you an extra six weeks of progression and then you'd go on to something else? A lot of people said, no, nah, I don't think that's a great idea. So it was interesting to, to look at what people wanted. And so we were looking at those trade-offs uh, as we moved through this. And what we really found was that whether it's overall survival or progression-free survival, um, we really set the benchmark really too low because we were saying, you know, we were trying to find the sweet, the sweet spot and we were asking, well, what about one month? What about two months? What about three months? What about four months, five months? And really... Almost everybody wanted more than five months, as you can see here. So the, the, the majority of the patients um, said that uh, that was really the beginnings of what they thought was significant to them or meaningful. And that was a minimum, which is important. And, of course, you'd say, well, of course, they're patients. They, 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 they would rather see five years instead of five months. Of course, we understand that. But when they're looking at a trial or when they're thinking about a trial they would go on, for example, and we say we're thinking that this trial, this, the investigational product in this trial is going to give you an extra six months, is that enough? And it appears that that may be. But if it's three and a half or four months, it appears that it's not and with the majority of patients. Um, so we're, we certainly need to dive into this deeper, but it is interesting in terms of how we look at it. What about toxicity? Uh, what's unacceptable? And the only thing that I was a little bit surprised uh, was that nausea um, wasn't uh, higher up there. For me, I, I, you know, um, I, I'm a weekend warrior and I have pain and I do you know, things like that, so I understand that concept. Uh, memory loss, certainly disturbing. Infection, disturbing. Uh, hospitalization, very disturbing. Um, and, and so those, those were the ones that really stood out. 
but I was a little surprised nausea uh, wasn't a little bit higher uh, because for me anyway, uh, and maybe you just get used to it, but for me, when I'm nauseated, I just can't do anything effectively, and it, it's kind of ruining my entire quality of life. So um be interesting to, to hear from you folks. We asked about a preference for um, a progression-free survival of three to four months, uh, no difference in overall survival, and absolutely no te- toxicity. So you'd gain, you'd gain uh, several months, and you'd have no trade-off in toxicity, or you could gain five to six months in overall survival. And we did a lot of these trade-offs, and this is just to give you an example of some of the things we came up with to try to figure this out. Uh, but you had toxicity, and the toxicity was three times the neurotoxicity uh, of normal. So you had uh, probably grade two to grade three at least uh, neurotoxicity. Uh, of course, a lot of patients said they don't like either of those, understandably. But the majority would take the overall survival and toxicity. And we know from other studies that it depends on context, right? So we know that patients who are in the frontline setting are where cure is very much um, at, at the forefront of the thought process because we know we're going to have a very high chance of curing a significant percentage, that becomes very important. If, if we are looking at patients who are um, in the recurrent setting, especially if it's been many, many lines of therapy, uh, we've come to the realization unless there's a major breakthrough, which there could be, uh, we're probably not looking at cure, but we're looking at trying to prolong life with the best quality of life for as long as possible. And so we know from other studies that that's certainly important. Um, but it's interesting to, to put some of these scenarios out there and, and see how they, they play off one another. Uh, we did some ranking. Uh, we did some log ranking in terms of what uh, people find uh, most important. And to give you some idea here um, in, in terms of uh, cure, Living longer, uh, feeling healthier were the big ones. Uh, response. I think response often gets missed. Um, drug companies and clinicians when they're interpreting clinical trials. So, um, you know, if you think about your visit when you come in, um, really what, what I'm trying to figure out is whether you're responding or not. I don't know what your progression-free survival is. I don't know what your overall survival is because those are all things that are going on in the future. But I can tell you if you're responding, and that's kind of the I feel good, you feel good visit. Um, I always tell the story, my, my shortest visit of the day is my nurse comes in and tells me that uh, uh, Mrs. Jones has uh, 16 complaints and I'm going to be in the room for about 40 minutes just hearing the complaints before we even get anywhere. And then I go in and say, hey, your CA-125 fell from 682 down to you know, 87 after just two cycles. And I said, how are you feeling? She goes, great. Is there anything I can do for you? Nope. She just wants to get right to chemo. She doesn't want me messing around with anything. She doesn't want me changing any doses. She certainly doesn't want to change the regimen. Um, so it, it, it's very interesting in terms of, um, you know, what, what patients want. And, and, but response rate is something that we often uh, don't take into account um, because that's that's in real time. And, and so I do think that that's an important thing. So I, I think the the main thing that we really wanted to bring out of this was that, the, that we really need to bring the patient's voice into the context of all this. Um, and, and I think that that, for me, was really what I learned by all this uh, moving forward. So in conclusion, I, I didn't get into a lot of the the individual drug development programs because literally I could spend about two, three hours going through drugs that attack P53 now, some of the CDK inhibitors, and and goes on and on and on. But honestly, um, many of those are going to be bust. And and so for me to sit here and and, and to talk about all those, um, I think is is frustrating. I'd rather talk about the principles and the classes of drugs that I think are going to be really promising moving forward. And I do think we're in a much better spot now uh, in terms of churning out uh, drugs that are going to be effective um, uh, than we have been probably ever because of all the convergence of the technologies that I talked about. So we are understanding how to individualize care. Um, We're able to recognize some of these unique drivers, um, and I think that that's important. Uh, this whole idea of, of sequencing and systems biology and, and combining all this type of information is really going to make a difference as we move forward. 
Um, and I, I think it's really exciting that we're able to even get the regulatory agencies, which have traditionally been very staunch in their stance, to be more proactive in terms of looking at how to approve drugs in ovarian cancer. Um, and so we need to continue to improve these trials because the most important resource that we have is the patients. Um, patients are by far our most important resource. We can't waste that on something that's not likely to work. We have to have trials that are, that are at least as good as the standard of care, but hopefully provide a number of great options for our patients. So smaller trials that are smarter, um, looking for bigger differences, and that's what our patients are telling us. That's the voice of the patient is we need to be looking for these bigger differences. Robin, I'm going to turn it back over for some questions, if I could. Okay, terrific. Thank you, Kate. Um, we have a question in the chat. Do you want me to take that, Robin? I see. Is that the uh, recaprib? Is that the recaprib question that you're seeing? Yes. Okay, great. So yes. So the question uh, basically boils down to toxicity with recaprib in terms of renal function, and all the PARP inhibitors have a little bit of that. Recaprib certainly does, um, and that's where they actually. So some of it. Um, uh, it's interesting that one of the carriers for creatinine is interfered with with this, so it artificially elevates the creatinine. Uh, so some of that's a real effect and some of it's more of an artifact. So that sort of needs to be followed uh, over time to make sure, that, of course, that the actual kidney function itself is, is not deteriorating. Uh, so it is something that you can see uh, over time, um, but generally not, uh, it's something generally patients don't have to come off the drug for. Occasionally, yes, but uh, usually not. So that's the good news. Okay, thank you. Um, again, two more questions in the chat. Questions, Dr. So the question is about breast cancer uh, that was treated last in 2014. Would, would drugs like raloxifen and tamoxifen be contraindicated? Well, you know, again, um, there's a lot more to your history that, that one would need, and, and, I, and I, uh, Robin will tell you I can't give out individual uh, advice here. Um, that's something you need to speak with your physician about because things like uh, what the ERPR status of this tumor was or what the stage of that tumor was, uh, all kinds of things go into that. Uh, but in general, uh, no, um, you, you, you should be able to um, take those drugs. Uh, but again, that's uh, giving you a general answer um, for that. Uh, next question, uh, with people surviving uh, longer, are you seeing more brain tumor metastasis? As we, yes. So the question is, are we seeing a change in the pattern of recurrence over time? And the answer is yes. I've seen recurrences with ovarian cancer that I never saw before in the last 10, 10 years. Um, mostly good news, right, because these patients uh, are living decades. And so um, while many patients, you know, 20, 30 years ago died in three, five years for sure, uh, now we have patients that are living well over 10 years, 15 years, and so on. And uh, we do see differences in some of those recurrences. One of them that we do see is a, is a slight uptake in, in the number that have uh, brain metastasis. In fact, we have two people on the service right now, I believe, that have uh, involvement of, of brain uh, on my on our service at, at uh, where I am, so I, I think that that's something that we normally would not have seen, um, and we're getting better at taking care of those patients as well. Um, so one of the patients this is actually her second recurrence in the brain, and neurosurgery thinks they've got a very good shot um, of reoperating and having a good outcome. Um, uh, so uh, it, it, it is different, um, but it's a it, it's a good problem to have. If we can change, if we can keep going, I'd, I'd like to see what recurrences look like at 30 years. Uh, if we could do that, um, let's see. Next is great. Uh, patient says grateful uh, to report no side effects at all from olaparib monotherapy entering 12th month. That's wonderful. Uh, CA125 dropped uh, down to normal uh, after cycle one. Um, and, and thanking me for a great webinar. So uh, this person is obviously very nice and very intelligent, <laughs> and very nice at least. But the, the, the point here that's very, very interesting, and, and I saw, I think, recent data with Lapra uh, in the setting was that there, I think, were about 13% of patients that were on the drug for over five years. And, and up to 40% up to of those were BRCA wild type 
meaning they did not have a, a mutation. So for some people, these PARP inhibitors work for not months, they work for years. Um, and, and again, I'm not, I don't want to sell false hope for someone else that has a different experience, and I've had patients that look like they might be in the former category and they're doing really well, and I've had patients that didn't do very well on the PARP uh, at all. So um, it, it's not for everyone, but uh, it, it is a great new class that we're very excited about because it offers options, and we like having options for patients. Okay, thank you. Um, anyone have a, a question by phone? I, I have a question. Can I? Please go ahead. Sure, go ahead. Um, so my question is if um, someone like myself, so I'm, um, I started having uh, ovarian cancer in 05, had it three times, and I've been NED for, you know, five years. I had Avastin and all kinds of things. But I've been off medication for almost four years. Is there anything, I know I'm in a kind of lucky cohort of people who've been, yes. you know, who are surviving. Yes. I'm actually a former patient of yours from New York. <laughs> but anyway, oh, yeah, <laughs> is, I mean, I'm just kind of walking around without a net. Is there anything going on for people like me, or do we just kind of take care of ourselves and do the best we can? I mean, um, you know, they had to take me off the Avastin, and I was on Cytoxin for many years, like seven or eight years, and eventually they wanted me off that as well. I, I don't know. Yeah. Is, there, is there anything else? So you have just not have been to... on a, you've, you've not been on a PARP inhibitor, right? No. Mm -mm. Yeah, I, I would predict that you would do very well on a PARP inhibitor. So for, for me, you know, I, I think um, probably really close surveillance, as, I'm, as I know you're yeah. doing. Yeah. And um, uh, the first hint, I would get you on uh, some form of platinum, uh, knock the tumor back down, and then put you on PARP maintenance. Um, that I mean, your your likely your likelihood of response and the long term response is extremely high. So it would just be for now, just screening, not, nothing pro like yeah, nothing I intervention. So. I, I okay. mean, uh, um, you know, we we uh, we occasionally uh, are able to eradicate all disease even after yeah. it's not the normal pattern. Um, but yeah. normally, you know, our best shots up front. But occasionally, I've had patients like you who mm -hmm. were able to do that after you know a couple of rounds of chemo. We 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 are able then to get rid of all the disease that we weren't able to get rid of in prior cycles. Um, it's not the norm, and I don't mm -hmm. want to. I, I certainly don't want to give the impression to everyone else out there that's the norm. <laughs> but uh, it, it does happen, and that's uh, that's that's why we keep fighting. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm much. glad you're doing so well. Thank you very much. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. I have a question about metformin. Yes. Um, the outlook for metformin potential for all of us to take it like we would fluoridate water. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's some trials looking at that, and we think there's a little bit of an interaction between metformin and the immune response and some other pathways that are very exciting. So, um, and then I, yet I've seen other data in some cohorts where the data has been uh, not that impressive. So uh, I think we need to identify uh, who's going to benefit from it. I have no doubt that there's going to be a subset of patients who are going to do well, but I think we need to flush that out yet. Thank you. Okay, I think this concludes our nope. webinar. I just want to take this opportunity to thank you, Dr. Herzog, for this wonderful and very comprehensive and um, enthusiastic presentation. Um, we uh, look forward to thanks, Robin, webinars. Thanks, for having me. And um, thank you so much for all you do for the ovarian cancer community. Um, thank you, thank you for having me. Much appreciated. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank Herzog. You. Very much. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Good night.